Today's topic is diffraction, which is the process by which a field is modified as it propagates through free space. And in particular, we're going to look at diffraction in the spatial frequency domain. And we'll make clear what we mean by this as we go along. Underlying everything we do will be a result that comes from Maxwell's equations, which is the uniqueness theorem. We're not going to derive this, but we're just going to state it. And the uniqueness theorem says that if, number one, the sources in a certain region are known. Number two, the tangential component of the electric field is known on the region's boundary and number three the region is filled with lossy material and this third point is really for kind of a mathematical requirement that uh, allows us to uh, avoid some you know, mathematical possibilities that are not of great practical importance. We can take the limiting case where the region is filled with a material with very, very low loss. Um, so there's really no loss of generality there. So again, more for mathematical reasons than for physical reasons. If this is true, then The field within the region is uniquely determined so for us we will make use of this result as diagrammed in this illustration here so Imagine this is the plane Z is equal to Z1 and all sources are to the left in the half space Z is less than Z1 and our region then is going to be the region Z greater than Z1 which we're going to represent as a hemispherically bounded region. So bounded on the left by the plane Z is equal to Z1 and on the right by the hemisphere um, Z is equal to Z1 plus the square root of R squared minus X squared minus Y squared which is the equation of a sphere centered at X equals 0, Y equals 0, Z is equal to Z1 and it's only the right half of that sphere, the hemisphere, with the radius going to infinity. And we suppose that in the plane Z is equal to Z1, there is some known field Let's call this G1 of X and Y. Then because the region Z greater than Z1 is filled with at least a slightly loss, lossy material, we know that the field 
goes to zero exponentially on the hemisphere. And therefore, we know the tangential component of the electric field over the region boundary. It's zero on the hemispherical part, and it's a known quantity, g1 of xy, on the planar part, z is equal to z1. And therefore, we know then that the field is completely determined within this region. And so we can say that g1 of x and y determines the field everywhere for z greater than z1. So we will make use of this result as follows. So here's our optical axis, z-axis, and here are the x and y axes. And we'll suppose that all sources for our optical field are over here to the left of the regions we're interested in. And then in a particular plane, z is equal to z1, we'll have some field, g1 of x and y, and then we'll be interested in what is the field in some other plane, call that g2 of x and y, where these two planes are separated by a distance d. And due to the uniqueness theorem, we know that G2 is a unique function of G1. So we'll write it as some transformation of G1 of X and Y. Now, for propagation in free space, well, free space... is electromagnetically linear and its shift invariant. It's shift invariant because free space looks the same if we shift our point of view. So therefore, if we take this input plane and shift it up, say along the x-axis, well, the output field, G2 of X and Y, must just be the same thing, just shifted up by that same amount, because the environment in which the field is propagating looks exactly the same, whether we shift this input up or down or left and right. Now, we know that means that this transformation must be representable as a convolution. G2 of x and y is the convolution of an impulse response, h of x and y, and the input, g1 of x and y. All right, let's think of this g1 over here as our uh, input, and the g2 as our output of a two-dimensional linear system. So this relationship here is in the spatial domain. Everything's done in the XY system. But we also know that for a shift invariant linear system, we can represent the input-output relationship in the spatial frequency domain. We can say big G2 of U and V is equal to a transfer function, H of U and V times big G1 of U and V. And so that is the relation in the spatial frequency domain. So what is that transfer function? This is the domain we're going to look at in this lecture, and then in the next lecture we'll look at the spatial domain. Well, we know that g1 of x and y can be represented as an inverse two-dimensional Fourier transform. Angular spectrum, big G1 of u and v, 
e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy du dv. And that factor is simply the x and y dependence of a plane wave, which we can write as e to the i 2 pi wz e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy. So if we represent this input field g1 of x and y in this form of an inverse Fourier transform, physically, this phase factor represents the x and y dependence of a plane wave. And therefore, physically, when this field propagates a distance d, the only change to this phase factor must be the addition of a term e to the i 2 pi w, and then z would be d, the amount we've propagated along the z-axis. And right, so this is just a plane wave. And so physically, this inverse Fourier transform is representing g1 of x and y as a linear superposition of plane waves. And we know how play, plane waves change as they propagate through space. They change by having this z phase factor added. And we worked out what w is in the paraxial approximation. It is 1 over lambda minus lambda over 2 u squared plus v squared. And so we can say that the transfer function of free space is just e to the i 2 pi w and then the amount by which we've changed the z coordinate d. And in the practical approximation, that break up, well, here we'd have e to the i 2 pi over lambda d. So e to the i 2 pi over lambda d. And then here we have minus e to the minus i, let's see, 2 pi and then over 2, so that'd just be pi, lambda, and z would be replaced by d, and then u squared plus v squared. So this would be e to the minus i pi lambda d u squared plus v squared. So the transfer function for free space is simply the change in the phase due to a change in the z coordinate, which in the paraxial approximation is that expression right there. So the transfer function of free space, h of u and v, is e to the i 2 pi over lambda d, e to the minus i pi lambda d u squared plus v squared. And we emphasize that that's only for free space. If we had an optical system with lenses or other things, well, then that system would not be shift invariant and it would not have the same transfer function or would not in fact have a transfer function and certainly would not have the transfer function of free space. So we're just talking about free space propagation right now. One of the things we can see immediately is that the magnitude of H and U and V is equal to one for all U and V. And physically that tells us that while propagation changes the phase of a plane wave, it does not change the amplitude. And that's just for a plane wave. So that's physically how we can interpret that. And now we have a formula, or you could say a recipe, for calculating diffraction. The output field, g2 of x and y, is some 
linear shift invariant transformation of the input field g1 of x and y and we can describe that transformation as follows first take the Fourier transform of little g1 so that would be the integral of g1 of x and y times e to the minus i 2 pi ux plus vy dx dy then calculate the angular spectrum of the output by multiplying the transfer function of free space and the angular spectrum of the input. Finally, calculate little g2 of x and y as the inverse Fourier transform of its angular spectrum, big G2 of u and v, e to the i, 2 pi, ux plus vy, And there we have a recipe for calculating the effects of diffraction. Now, it's a little bit intimidating because it involves two Fourier transform, one forward and one uh, inverse uh, operations. So it may not be the most mathematically convenient approach, um, although in some cases, maybe it is reasonably uh, convenient. However, it has a very nice physical interpretation. It just says, let's consider the input field as a linear superposition of plane waves and the amplitude of a plane wave with spatial frequencies u and v is just g1 of u and v. Then each of those plane waves simply suffers a change in phase given by our h of u and v here. And then we reassemble all those plane waves um, and put them together and we get the output field, G2 of X and Y. By the way, to go in the opposite direction, if we knew G2 of X and Y, we could go and perform what we might call inverse diffraction. and calculate G1 of X and Y. And all we would simply need to do in the spatial frequency domain is simply divide by H of U and V, all right? So in other words, the angular spectrum of the input would just be one over the transfer function of free space times the angular spectrum of the output. And because h of u and v has a magnitude 1 everywhere, it doesn't dis disappear. It doesn't go to 0 for any u and v. Uh, this 1 over h of u and v is well-defined for all, in u, all u and v. And so this is a um, well-defined operation. And in fact, what would be 1 over h of u and v? What would be the transfer function, we could say, for inverse diffraction from going to the output back to the input? Well, 1 over h of u and v would be, let's see, well, if it would just be 1 over a phase factor. 1 over e to the i theta is e to the minus i theta. So we simply just replace i by minus i in this expression. So it just becomes e to the minus i. 2 pi over lambda d and e to the minus minus i or e to the plus i pi lambda d u squared plus v squared and we can see that that's just h of u and v with the replacement of d by minus d which makes sense it just says propagate in the reverse direction instead of going a distance d to the right along the z-axis, go that same distance to the left. Now let's apply our diffraction recipe 
to a very important type of field, the so-called Gaussian beam. So a Gaussian beam will have the form G1 of X and Y is equal to some amplitude big A, e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over little a squared. So if we look uh, in cross section, say along the x axis, this will look like a bell curve. And at x is equal to plus or minus a, it doesn't matter because you put the squaring here. Uh, if the amplitude is equal to, say, uh, is equal to big A, at x is equal to zero, it will reduce to big A times x, x squared will become a squared, so a squared over a squared, this will be at y is equal to zero. Uh, it'll reduce by a factor of e to the minus pi. Uh, which is less than about 5% of its amplitude at x is equal to 0. And because it depends on x squared plus y squared, which is equal to r squared, we know that it will be have circular symmetry in the xy plane. So you'll have contours of constant field amplitude, which will be circles. And it will be st strongest right on the axis and then drop off as a uh, as a Gaussian function. Let's take a look at the total power in this beam. So we'll integrate over all x and y the magnitude of g1 of x and y squared. So the magnitude squared of the electric field. So that'll be proportional to the power. And what is that? Because of this uh, circular symmetry, we can do this conveniently in polar coordinates. So we'll have magnitude of a squared. It has no phi dependence. So it'll just be the integral from 0 to 2 pi in phi and the integral from 0 to infinity in the radial coordinate r of the square of this will be e to the minus 2 pi r squared over a squared, or quantity r over a squared, r dr d theta. And the theta integral will just bring you a factor of 2 pi. Uh, and then you can do this as a, a basic integral that can be done, because here you've got an r squared, and here's an r, so you can think of this as e to the minus u, and then you can set up a du here. And if you go through and do that, you end up with the result the magnitude of a squared times little a squared over 2. So that's the total power in the field. And then if you ask, well, what um, uniform circular field, say, of a radius RE would have that same power? Well, if the field has the same amplitude A everywhere, that it's not zero, that'd be the magnitude of a squared times the area of the aperture. So let's say we, we have an aperture here with a radius re, then this would just be that times pi re squared. And if you equate these two, you get that the effective radius re then we could say would be a over the square root of two pi. So kind of in the spirit that we define the effective width of a sink or a sink squared function, we could define the effective width of a Gaussian beam to be um, the radius, or really I should say the effective radius. It would be the radius of a uniform disk, which had the same amplitude as the Gaussian beam on the axis uh, and had the same total power. So we could take that to be the effective radius if we wanted to. But for simplicity, we're just going to say, we're just going to call A the beam radius. Uh, 
And then if we want this uh, equivalence between power idea, well, we just divide that by the square root of 2 pi. And so if you take this expression, and instead of integrating from 0 to infinity, you integrate from 0 to a, you find that you get about 99.8% or 0.998 of the total power p, and so that's how much that falls within a disk, uh, r less than or equal to a. And so the great majority of the power falls between these two limits uh, along the x-axis, minus a or a, or if you're looking at it in polar uh, coordinates between r from zero to a. So if we're going to use our recipe for diffraction, then we're going to say that, well, this is going to be our G1. And our G2, then, G2 of U and V in the spatial domain is going to be the transfer function of free space, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d, e to the minus i, um, pi lambda d, u squared plus v squared times the Fourier transform of this Gaussian beam. Well, we already worked out that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. In, in one dimension, e to the minus pi x squared Fourier transforms to e to the minus pi u squared. And so we can do that here in two dimensions and use the scaling theorem. Uh, because of the 1 over a squared term there. And we get that g1 of u and v, the Fourier transform of this Gaussian beam, is big A, little a squared from the scaling theorem, e to the minus pi a squared u squared plus v squared. Therefore, the output field G2 of x and y would be, I would pull out all factors that don't depend on the spatial frequencies u and v, that'd be e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d, big A, little a squared, and then we would have an inverse Fourier transform of the angular spectrum of G2, which would be, here's our transfer function, e to the minus i pi lambda d u squared plus v squared. The angular spectrum of the input, e to the minus I, pi a squared u squared plus v squared. And then the inverse Fourier transform factor, e to the i pi, uh, e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy du dv. So that would be our output field. So kind of complicated, but they're all um, phase factors, and so maybe we can combine them. Let's now notice that in all cases, right, you can break each of these up into a u factor times a v factor. So let's break up and look at the u factors. So we would have e to the minus i pi lambda d u squared. And from here we get e to the minus pi a squared u squared. And then we would have e to the i 2 pi ux. Let's save that for later. Right now let's combine these together because they both have a u squared. So let's combine these as e to the minus pi a squared u squared and then here we'll have the minus signs there so we don't need a minus sign but we have an i and the pi is will be factored out here so i lambda d so a squared plus i lambda d all times u squared and let's write that as right because of the quantity in parentheses is just some complex constant we'll write this the whole thing then as e to 
to the minus pi alpha squared u squared. So up here, the, the integral, at least the, uh, the u part of the integral, will have the form of the integral e to the minus pi alpha squared u squared e to the i 2 pi ux du. And that is just the inverse Fourier transform of this Gaussian term e to the minus pi alpha squared u squared. And we know how to Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform Gaussians. And then we apply this uh, scale theorem or this uh, scale factor of alpha. And we get that this is equal to 1 over alpha e to the minus pi x squared over alpha squared. All right, and that comes again because e to the minus pi u squared inverse transforms to e to the minus pi x squared, and then we use the uh, scaling theorem. So if we do that also for the v terms, which will be identical just with, uh, with v's instead of uh, u's and a, and a y instead of an x, and then include these factors out in front, we get that g2 of x and y will be big A, little a squared. We're going to get a 1 over alpha for each of the u and the v terms, so that'll give us a 1 over alpha squared. e to the i 2 pi over lambda d. And then these type of terms for both x and y, so e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over alpha squared. Now, alpha here, um, right, which in the alpha squared, by the way, if we just look back at our definition right there, that's the alpha squared right there. So alpha squared is complex. So it's nice to break that up explicitly into real and imaginary parts. Let's deal with this term first. Let's look at uh, little a squared over alpha squared. That'll be a squared over, and here's our alpha squared. So that'd be over a squared plus i lambda d, and divide top and bottom by a squared. That'll be 1 over 1 plus i lambda d over a squared. Now, inside this, uh, this Gaussian here, let's write 1 over uh, alpha squared is equal to 1 over a squared plus i lambda d. Um, and now, in this case, let's actually break this up into real and imaginary parts by multiplying top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. So we'll get that uh, we have a squared minus i lambda d over a squared minus i lambda d. So for the denominator, we'll get, right, it's just a complex number of times it's conjugate, so it's the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part. So that'll be a to the fourth plus lambda d squared, and for the real part, we'll have the a squared up top, and then for the imaginary part, well, we'll have minus i lambda d, so we'll write this as minus i lambda d over this same denominator, a to the fourth, plus lambda d squared. And now for this first term, let's divide top and bottom by a squared. So that'll be 1 over a squared, and let's write it this way, a squared times the quantity 1 plus lambda d over a squared squared. So let's see, make sure I did that right here. 
So we'll have 1 over a squared, so that's just a to the fourth over a squared, and then plus a squared times lambda d over a squared squared. So that'll be lambda d squared over a squared, which would be lambda d squared over a squared. So that all works out well. And then this term, lambda d over a squared, that's dimensionless. It's meters squared over meters squared. And then for the next term, we'll set, write this as minus i. Let's put this over lambda d. If we did that, pulled out a 1 over lambda d, then that would put a, we have to put a factor lambda d up in the numerator to counteract that. So that'd be lambda d squared here. And then we could divide numerator and denominator by lambda d squared. And so this would just become 1. So that would be over 1 plus a to the fourth over lambda d squared, which we'll write as a squared over lambda d quantity squared, like so. So that's nice because now here, again, a squared over lambda d is dimensionless. And so we've got an a squared here, meters squared, and a lambda d, which would be meters squared there. And so all the dimensions go into those two factors. All right, so now we want to put that in to this Gaussian term and break out the real and imaginary parts because the real part will give us the um, envelope, the amplitude of this field, and the imaginary part will give us the phase. So doing that, here's what we get. G2 of x and y is equal to big A over 1 plus i lambda d over a squared e to the i 2 pi over lambda d and then we'll break out the imaginary part of that previous expression we had to get our phase so let's see we had a uh, minus i over lambda d and so um, our e to the minus pi times that will give us a plus i pi over lambda d x squared plus y squared over 1 plus a squared over lambda d quantity squared and then the real part gives us the amplitude e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a squared times 1 plus lambda d over a squared quantity squared. So as far as the x and y dependence, this is a pure phase, and this is an amplitude. And we're going to write that amplitude in this form. e to the minus pi, let me space it down a little more, e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over b squared, where b squared is this quantity, so b, the square root of that, would be equal to a times the square root of 1 plus the quantity lambda d over a squared squared. And we'll call that the beam radius. Analogous to how we called A the beam radius of the input field. So what we see is that for a Gaussian beam, as it diffracts, it remains a Gaussian beam in the sense that the amplitude is a Gaussian, uh, but the beam radius changes. So at d is equal to 0, this of course is just equal to a, and as d gets bigger, well, the beam radius gets bigger. And that's the property of diffraction. A field tends to spread out. A field that is limited to a region in space tends to, to spread out. Let's look at some limiting cases of this. We're going to have what we're going to call the, the near field. limit d goes to zero so for that 
down here in this uh, denominator for this overall amplitude, we're going to say then in that limit, 1 plus i lambda d over a squared just goes to 1 because d is getting really small. And here, of course, b is going to go to a because this term gets very, very small. This is a d squared and d is going to 0. And then up here, 1 plus a squared over lambda d, let's see. Well, now in this case, d is going to 0, so this is an over d term, so this is going to get very big. So we're going to say in, for that term, 1 plus a squared over lambda d quantity squared is we can neglect the 1 because this term is going to get very big. So that's going to just be a squared over lambda d squared. Now, let's look at this phase here, and we'll leave off the i, so just everything after the i. So we're going to have pi over lambda d, and then with this approximation, this is going to be the inverse of this term, so that's going to be lambda d quantity squared over a squared squared, or a to the fourth, and then times x squared plus y squared. And let's see, we can cancel one lambda d there and rewrite this as pi and let me re put it this way pi lambda d over a squared times x squared plus y squared over a squared so we took one a squared and put it here with these terms and the other put it over with the x squared plus y squared now because everywhere um, the amplitude of the field, which is e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a squared, everywhere that's significant, x squared plus y squared over a squared is less than or equal to 1. So we could replace this by 1, and then we look at, as a worst case, and then we look at this term, and d is going to 0, so this is going to go to 0. And so in that limit, this phase is going to be much, much less than pi. So this will be e to the i, some phase is much less than pi. And so that's essentially, we can replace that by 1. And so the phase, that phase term basically just goes to 1. And therefore, we get the result that g2 of x and y would look like, so we have over here, let's see. Um, we're going to replace this denominator by 1. So we just have a. And then we've got this phase factor, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d. And then we've just argued that this phase factor essentially is just 1, because the, uh, the phase is so small. And then that leaves us finally with the amplitude factor, e to the minus pi, x squared plus y squared, and B goes to A, so it's over A squared. And what is that? Well, that is simply E to the I 2 pi over lambda D times our original Gaussian beam, which was our G1 of X and Y. So we see that in what we've called the near field limit, and we'll make this rigorous later on, more rigorous, that basically we just get the same field, but it just has a global phase factor e to the i 2 pi over lambda d, which is the phase change you would get for a plane wave propagating along the optical axis, a distance d, when it has a wavelength lambda. So let's again write down our exact result. g2 of x and y is amplitude big A over 1 plus i lambda d over a squared, e to the i 2 pi over lambda d, e to the i pi over lambda d, x squared plus y squared over 1 plus a squared over lambda d quantity squared,
times e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a squared times the quantity 1 plus quantity lambda d over a squared squared. Okay, that's our exact field. Now let's look at another limit. We're going to call this the far field limit. And all right, we've got these terms, lambda d over a squared or, or a squared over lambda d. We're going to define the far field limit to be lambda d over a squared goes to infinity. So a, uh, a squared and lambda would be fixed, and then this would mean that d is going to infinity. But specifically, we're going to it allow us to say, well, in this term here, this, this thing is going to infinity. This is 1 over that, so that's going to 0, and so on. Okay. So in that limit, down here in this denominator, we'd have 1 plus i lambda d over a squared. Well, lambda d over a squared is going to infinity, so we can neglect the 1 and say this is i lambda d over a squared. Uh, for this term, obviously, uh, a squared over lambda d is going to 0. So we can say 1 plus a squared over lambda d squared is, would just go to 1, because this would go to 0. And then here, we'd have a squared times quantity 1 plus lambda d over a squared quantity squared. We can neglect the 1 relative to this, because this is going to infinity. And then the a squared times, this would be over a squared squared, so it'll cancel one of those. And that'll then mean that this is going to go to, well, we can write it this way, lambda d over a quantity squared. So this will have lambda d squared in the numerator. In the denominator, it'll just have an a squared, which will be the a to the fourth, and then one a squared canceled from this term here. So in that limit, our output field, g2 of x and y, would look like, let's see, so for this we'd get uh, big A times this term, uh, the inverse of this term, is the term down in the denominator, so that would be big A, we're going to get an a squared over i lambda d, so a squared over i lambda d, and we got this phase factor, e to the i, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d. And then this becomes e to the i pi over lambda d. And because we got rid of this, this here, and that just replaced that by 1, that's just that times x squared plus y squared. And then for this, it's going to look like e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared and we said that denominator goes to lambda d over a quantity squared lambda d over a quantity squared so this is uh, still a, a Gaussian um, and now we see that in this limit what happens here well this is the beam width lambda d over a, and as d increases, that beam width increases linearly. So this is a picture in which we would say, if this is the z-axis, and this is at z is equal to 0, and this is some um, beam width a, that what we're going to see is something that's going to go like this. And as we get very far away, that beam width is going to follow, it's going to increase linearly, and it's going to look like it's spreading out at an angle theta. Where, well, because the beam width will be 
lambda d over a. And we could say that's equal to lambda over a times d. And for a small angle, we could say, well, that's like theta times d, which would correspond to, to b is equal to tangent of theta times d. And so this angle theta would look like lambda, I'm sorry, would look like lambda over a. And so this is a beam width a here at z is equal to zero. And as we go to the right and we get very far out into this far field limit, the beam width would increase as if it was following a pattern which expanded at an angle theta, which is lambda over a. So the smaller this beam width is at z is equal to zero, the larger is this angle. The more rapidly this thing spreads out. Conversely, the larger the beam width is at z is equal to zero, the more slowly the beam expands out. And this is a characteristic, uh, kind of in general, of diffraction. Uh, if you have a very tightly compacted field at z is equal to zero, uh, as z increases, it tends to spread out more rapidly than if you had a more spread out field at z is equal to zero. All right. And so in general, this, this curve would exactly be um, b is equal to a times the square root, right, just the square root of this, 1 plus lambda d over a squared squared. That would be the exact expression, and it would have this limiting case. Uh, for small z, small d, it would simply just be, essentially just be a, and as you get very far away, then it goes to this limit here. Let's look at a special case, that of a field that has circular symmetry. That is a field g1 of x and y, which has the form of g1 of r, where r, r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. And in this case, the angular spectrum will also have circular symmetry. We'll define rho to be the square root of u squared plus v squared. And in this case, the transfer function of free space, we will write as e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d, and then u squared plus v squared is rho squared, so then the phase term here, it depends on u, u and v, will be e to the minus i pi lambda d, just rho squared. And in a previous lecture, in fact, in the previous lecture, we looked at the case of two-dimensional Fourier transforms and inverse Fourier transforms when we have circular symmetry, and these reduced to a single integral transform, the so-called Fourier-Bessel transform. So in this case, the angular spectrum of the input field, big G1 of rho, would be 2 pi times the integral from 0 to infinity, little g1 of r, Bessel function of order 0, j0, 2 pi r rho, r dr. And then the angular spectrum for the output, g2 of rho, would be the transfer function of free space times the angular spectrum of the input. And then finally, the output field would be circularly symmetric and would be the inverse Fourier-Bessel transform of g2 of rho, 2 pi, the integral from 0 to infinity, g2 of rho, j0, 2 pi, um, r rho, rho, d rho. And so in this case, we can put all these steps together and write that the output g2 of r will be, let's see, let's take this factor out here, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d. We've got two factors of 2 pi, so that's a 2 pi squared. And then we've got this inverse Fourier-Bessel transform, the integral from 0 
to infinity. And now let's write our G2 of rho as H of rho times G1 of rho. And we'll actually write now the transform that gives you the G1 of big G1 of rho. That's the integral from zero to infinity. G1 of, and instead of R, we're using R here for the output variable. So let's use a dummy variable S for that. G1 of S, J0 of two pi S rho S ds, then times the h of rho, we've already pulled out this factor, so that leaves this factor here, e to the minus i pi lambda d rho squared, and then j0 2 pi r rho rho d rho. So there's the complete diffraction uh, recipe put into one equation and so we still we have to do two two integrals but they're only one-dimensional integrals instead of two-dimensional integrals now that is something that is uh, doable numerically even if we can't do it analytically and so in the PDF notes we go through and develop that technique for doing that that integral numerically and give some code for calculating this numerically in the appendix. So here is that code. And um, so we define here our function g1 of r. This is just a, a Gaussian beam with a vector radius of a, which will be five, all distances are interpreted as being in wavelengths. So this is a radius of five wavelengths. And then LD here, that's the lambda times D is a distance in wavelengths. So we're a thousand, that's pretty far away. And RM here is just gonna be the maximum value for our G2 of R plot. So the first thing that happens is we go through and we calculate the, um, the angular spectrum here, G1 of the input field up front and we'll get a plot of that and so we can look here it's it's a Gaussian and we want to make sure that uh, it it's drops down and is effectively zero for the largest row value and that's given up here max of row is 2.3 etc and those uh, if that was not big enough we could go in here in order to convert the uh, integral from zero to infinity to an integral from zero to one, we use a, a logarithmic transformation here. So if I made this, uh, this value smaller, like 10 to the uh, uh, minus two, that'd be correspond to 10 to the minus two, then this, this value would get bigger. So as long as that's okay, then what that does is it writes out this file, g1.dat, which then can be used for further calculations. We don't have to continue to recalculate the uh, angular spectrum. And so if we run this again, now we should get the diffracted field. And here it is in the blue curve. And we've all, also plotted uh, down here with red dots, the our, our known exact amplitude for the Gaussian, which we can solve for exactly. And that just verifies our numerical calculations are, are accurate. Uh, let's go down here to zero, zero distance of zero. Uh, and we've got way too large a uh, range of R values. Let's maybe make this 10. Okay, and so there's the original field. So now we can do things like, let's comment out this and uncomment this here, which is a field that is uh, smoothly varies to zero at a radius R is equal to A. It's a cosine pi R over two A squared. And then is zero for R greater than A. So let's uh, now to do this, this is a new G1 of r so we've got to get rid of the old g1.dat file so that it will know to recalculate that and let's run that and okay there, there's the spectrum and it's going flat to zero there at the uh, maximum value so that's good enough run it again now here we get at uh, lambda times d is equal to zero 
blue curve is uh, this cosine squared term. So that goes precisely to zero at, at r is equal to five, and then is, is zero everywhere else. And you see that's fairly close to the, uh, the, the Gaussian, but now we can compare, because this is an actual field that you could implement, because it has a finite width, whereas the Gaussian, of course, is never uniformly zero. It's always non-zero out to infinity. And let's uh, do a distance of, oh, maybe 100. Maybe this needs to be about 40. Let's see. And so there is uh, the diffraction of that cosine squared field. And maybe we go out to 1,000. Okay, so there is a comparison of those, those two different fields. Um, and you can see there's an actual field that we could implement in the real world that would be at least roughly approximate to the behavior of the, the Gaussian. So using that uh, software, here are some calculations of the diffracted field due to a circular aperture. So the blue uh, solid dots here represent the field at the input plane. So it's one inside this aperture of radius, one wavelength, so a diameter of two wavelengths. And then the red circles are the diffracted field, in this case at a distance d of one wavelength. So there's some spreading outside of the boundaries of the original aperture, some rearrangement of the amplitude inside the aperture. Here's at two wavelengths, more spreading. Here's at four wavelengths and eight wavelengths. And so for these last two, we also have the green squares, which are a plot of the angular spectrum of the input field at AR over lambda D, and then a scale factor here out in front. And you can see that the diffracted field is starting to look a lot like this scaled version of the angular spectrum of the input field. And as you get farther away, that agreement gets better and better. We'll see that this is the nature of the so-called far field limit, that when you get out into the far field, the diffracted field is just a, at least the amplitude of it, is simply a scaled version of the amplitude of the angular spectrum of the input field. In other words, we'll see that nature essentially likes to take two-dimensional Fourier transforms with optics. So as you can see here, as you get farther away, as we mentioned for the Gaussian beam, you get more and more spreading. Things tend to spread out farther and farther from their original constrained condition at the input plane. So let's see if we can uh, figure out, at least uh, kind of informally, why there might be a relationship between the angular spectrum of the input field and the output field for very large distances. Now let's imagine we have an input field that is of limited spatial extent, say by an aperture A, and this is the Z optical axis, say this is X, we'll just think about this in two dimensions. So imagine that the field inside this aperture has various spatial frequency components, and the spatial frequency component U, because we know that, right, uh, U in a paraxial approximation is equal to theta over lambda. Theta is the angle with respect to propagation uh, with respect to the Z axis. So if U is equal to zero, theta is equal to zero, and we can imagine this component just projecting along parallel to the Z axis like so. So that would be the U is equal to zero component projecting out a distance D. And now imagine a non-zero U value. Well, that would correspond to a non-zero angle. Theta is equal to lambda U. And that might project out like so. So this would be u is equal to some theta over lambda. And these would be little projections of the aperture. And we can see what would happen if you got far enough away, these two uh, spatial frequency components, which look like little truncated plane waves, would eventually separate. 
And that would look like the calculation for that would be like so, a triangle that has a base of D and a height of A, because if these separate by a distance A, then they no longer overlap, and this would be an angle theta. And theta is lambda U. And so we would need to have, uh, for small angles, the tangent of theta, A over D, would be just equal to theta, which is lambda u. Now, if you have a field limited uh, in spatial extent to a, uh, a length a, you can expand it in a Fourier series. And the fundamental frequency would be 1 over a. So that would be the smallest non-zero u value. So if we set this to be equal to lambda and u is 1 over a, right? so you'd have components of 0, 1 over a, it would be like this, u would be equal to 0, 1 over a, 2 over a, and et cetera, as typical for Fourier series, that uh, you get integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. So in this case, what do we get? Let's see. So multiply through lambda d here and then a squared there. So you'd have, this would be true if lambda d was greater than a squared, these two little uh, truncated plane waves would separate out. Now our actual bar field condition is that lambda d is much, much greater than a squared, or we also wrote this as lambda d over a squared is much, much bigger than 1. Uh, and because this little back of the envelope uh, picture here doesn't take into account that these truncated plane waves would also start to diffract. But you can see what's going on here. Different spatial frequency components will eventually spatially separate. So if we looked at the amplitude of the field at this point, we would just be seeing the contribution from the angular spectrum of the input field at this particular spatial frequency, u. And likewise down here and everywhere in the output plane. So, here's z, x, and y. And if we have, remember that if we have a plane wave propagating with some propagation vector k, the spatial frequencies will be related to the angles of propagation. One way to uh, parameterize that would be in terms of the angles k makes with the three different coordinate axes. Here's a theta z, here's a theta x, and here's a theta y. And in that parameterization, we'd say that k would be equal to 2 pi over lambda. That's the magnitude of k. And then a unit vector that gives the direction of k, cosine theta x, cosine theta y, and cosine theta z. That's just the inner product of a unit vector in the direction of k, which with each of the coordinate vectors. Or another way to parameterize this that we've already talked about, because this has the downside that these three angles are not independent, but they have to form a unit vector. So cosine theta x squared plus cosine squared theta y plus cosine squared theta z has to be equal to one. So another parameterization would be to use polar coordinate angles. In that case, here would be your k. This would now just be theta. And if you project k back into the xy plane, here would be an angle phi. And in this parameterization, you'd have 2 pi over lambda sine theta cosine phi sine theta sine phi and cosine theta. And in all cases, that has, this has to be equal to 2 pi u v w. So the, the spatial frequencies u, v, and w are directly related to angles of propagation. Therefore, the different spatial frequency components of the field at the input plane will propagate at different angles. And if we get far enough away, they will specially separate. And so the amplitude of the output field, far away in the far field, 
will correspond to a corresponding spatial frequency component at the angle, for example, in this case, theta is lambda u. And that is an explanation, which we'll make more rigorous in the next lecture, of why when we get into the far field, the diffracted field is essentially just a scaled version of the angular spectrum of the input field. And in other words, nature likes to take two-dimensional Fourier transforms using optics.